Aloha. It, we're here to talk about the 8140 program, more specifically, though, upskilling, what it's all about. I'm James Stanger from CompTIA. I represent, along with Brian here, Jim and John, the C3. You may never heard of it before, but basically, consortium of the leading cybersecurity providers uh, when it comes to education and certification. ISACA in John Brandt here, right? Fitzy in Jim Wiggins. Mr. Brian Correa from GIAC, SANS GIAC, and then James Stanger from CompTIA. Uh, folks, if you want, you can come and sit. There's a chair right here if you want. Uh, so come on in here. Uh, let's see. Uh, this lady here gets to give the first five-minute introduction. Uh, no, it's <laughs> so nice to have you. Um, is it David? Is that your name, David? David? He's got all sorts of questions. I think you have questions. Mark Gorak here. Uh, from the DOD uh, has basically said we're really interested in answering questions as much as possible. Folks, as the attack surface, some people call it the problem surface, has changed, we have serious changes in our upskilling needs. And what we have looked at and what we have seen is the 8140 program. How many of you are interested in, see in hearing more about that program? I know I am, right? What the changes are from 8570, et cetera. So what we're going to be doing is uh, doing some questions here. But what I'd like to do right away, uh, just have a quick introduction. Uh, Mark, just a quick introduction from yourself. And let's go ahead and get right into some questions, shall we? So uh, Mark Gorak, uh, DOD CIO, uh, Resources and Analysis. So one of the directorates I run is the Workforce Directorate. So most of you don't really care who I am or where I come from, but <laughs> I'm responsible through my Workforce Innovation Directorate for the 8170 series. So real quick, I just want to ask you all some questions. There Show of go. hands. How many people know what a work role is? Raise your hand. Okay, only about half of you. So that's an interesting point right there, which we'll dive into. Uh, how many people actually know what the 80, um, our, our policy series? We have three a DODI, a DODD, and a DODM manual on training requirements are. How many people know that series? Anyone's? Okay, military in the room. Are you bound by that reg? Raise your hand if you think you're bound by it. Okay, real quick, when do you have to be trained by? Anybody know the answer? Meet the basic levels of proficiency. It's not a hand up. Anybody know the date? Date. It depends if you're cyber effects or if you're operator. You have two years from the date of publication from our manual, which was February, which means you have a year plus left to be certified. Okay, the people to my left or right can get you certified. Uh, they're the ones who provide all that training. Okay, what are those levels? It depends on your work role. So I'll pick on somebody. Major Sun, are you in cyber? Okay, wrong. Who's in cyber? Who's in cyber here got a job role in cyber? I see the person with the coffee right here. What's your name? Why don't you stand up, come to my microphone real quick, if you don't mind. Oh, well, I was thinking workforce. about the gentleman in the, in the, uh, in the uniform. <laughs> yeah, come on up here. In a uniform yeah. who's in cyber. Yeah, come on up here. So real quick, do you know what work role you're in? It changed, so I'm in a uh, supervisor work role, role supervisor? right now. Supervisor? Right. Okay, and your um, team, do you want work roles, Leif? So we haven't fully adapted DCWF yet. Um, we do DCWF, have DOD Cyber Workforce Framework. framework. Correct, we, we are uh, certified with Security Plus uh, I am technician level one, two, and three, and management level one, two, and three, depending on what they're doing. Um, I would fall under management level two with the CSSP. Um, but we're, we're the currently, the Air Force is currently in the process of adapting DCWF for our one Delta seven community, which is our cyber folks. Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> that's the reason why I'm here today, is to help you, especially as a supervisor, to manage your workforce and to help us determine which work roles, right, specifically for what you do, not just your MOS or qualification series or occupational series for civilians, but what do you actually do? And then from an OSD perspective, we set the policy, but you all have to implement that policy. So, and then we have training providers to help you meet those levels of proficiency. In addition, 
you are going to be responsible. I determine the basic level of proficiency. You as a supervisor need to determine the intermediate and advanced levels of what those proficiency levels are and what they require and how do you maintain those. Okay, this is not a trivial event to make this happen. But what's our goal of all of us? Thanks, you can sit down. What's our goal? Our goal is to have a train and ready force, right? It's a directly readiness. We need all of our partners to make this happen. How often is the technology changing in cyber? How often? Okay, every day. Other answers. Weekly, monthly. Are we on a 10-year plan in cyber? <laughs> I hope if not. you were trained 10 years ago and you're still doing that same job today, I submit to you you're not doing the leading edge of cyber today. Okay? I, my prior job was the deputy director of the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. AI was changing about every 8 to 12 months. A new whole cycle of applications, tools, ways to do business. I submit to you we're in the same kind of pattern in cyber. How do you maintain proficiency levels in cyber when you're changing every 12 months? And oh, by the way, you're at 60% strength. And I'm going to tell you that about one day out of every two weeks, one full day every two weeks, you need to spend on training. That's the average. How do you do that when you're only at 60% strength? How do you balance that? Right? That's going to be a leadership challenge for all of you. So just to open up kind of the context of where we are and where we need to go, that's what this discussion and talk is about. And the great thing is we have great partners. Right? When I look at the cyber workforce, I look at it as our partnerships, military, all components, civilians, DOD, Air Force, Army, all the services, and our contractors. I can't do it without those three. Those are our cyber workforce. And then we have all of our partners, right? Our other partners like SANS here at the table who help us provide training, who help us get our certifications, okay? And oh, by the way, any components here uh, from a service level? Service any level. service level people. Any service, Army, Navy, headquarters? I know I have some OSD friends here, but OSD, we're just policy guys. Okay, so that's the context where we're at. Your question should be, how do we get there? Or challenge me, what do you need from us? What authorities? What um, you know, policy, right? I write policy, I do oversight, and I do governance. That's my job. I provide it to you. I try not to order you, although in the manual, I'm telling you, you have to be trained within two years. Two years. That should be enough time to get trained. So that's, let me ask a question about that, Mark. We have a, uh, when it comes to timeline. First of all, how many of you are familiar with 8570, right? We're now with 8140, right? You can still behave as if 8570 existed. But let me ask you a question. Have there been any recent changes in the manual in terms of timelines, et cetera, things like that, or any other areas? Yeah, so great question. So we published the 8140, I believe, in February. Okay, let me stop right there. Where can they find it? Don't give the URL, but where can they Google for it? Yeah, just search DOD Emerging Tech. Okay, it's actually DOD Emerging T-E-C-H dot com. Okay, and you can go there, you can click on all of our programs, but it'll give you the cyber strategy, it'll give you the 8140 series, um, 8170, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it'll give you all of those right there. So you can look them up. Thanks, Mark. Go ahead. You, you, so you can continue. So what's changed? Well, I can tell you, believe it or not, that manual took five years to complete. Five been years. Watching it. Yeah. That's unacceptable. I'll take responsibility for that. We published it in February. Uh, I immediately said we need to revise it. It's already out of date, right? So I've told our team we have to be adaptive, flexible, and responsive to you, the workforce. Okay, and our vendors and partners. I have the ability to change the DCWF, our work roles, on a quarterly basis. Last year we added 20, roughly 20 new work roles and updated about eight of them. AI, data, software are all now work roles within the DCWF. And we changed a lot of the other, cyber effects we just changed last month. So you're gonna see those changes come out. Okay, I can change them every quarter. Can you react to every quarter with new training standards and new standards for your KSATs? No, you cannot. 
it takes you about a year or two to catch up. Mm -hmm. So I have to balance how often we change to keep up with technology and how fast the, the force can actually change and re-educate and train the force. So it's a balancing act from my side, but I need your feedback and if I'm moving too quickly. Because I have some partners who say I'm not moving quickly enough, which DOD usually does not move that quickly in this space. I think we do need to move quickly, so I'm pushing that envelope. You let me know if I'm moving too quickly. So that's my request from you all as a field. So what changes are needed? Lots of changes. Give me your feedback. And I'll start changing those without having to change the whole series at once. I don't want to spend five years in the adjudication cycle for a technical manual. So great question, Brian. Yeah, Thank you. Question, oh, if you have a question. Go to the mic right there. Come on over here. Just walk over here to this microphone here and ask away. Uh, what's your name, first of all? Tom? Question. My name is Joe. Oh, Joe. Oh, and I'm, Joe. I'm from Paycom. Okay. So, great. Um, question number one for um, Mark and question number two for you. James. Okay. Got First one, right now we are having problem with Navy Cool looking at twins. The work road is not um, corresponding. So how do, we, how do we have a better place to... Uh, consolidate to reposit, I mean, the repository about the work road so we can get those Navy cool tokens to continue the CEUs. Okay, so I think what you're asking me is <clears throat> the work role you have right now, whatever it is, does not meet the case stats that are required. So the first, the way you approach that is every quarter we have a senior, uh, cyber workforce management board, four star level, okay? I just met with your one yesterday and said they need to go to that board and raise these concerns. So sec behind the scenes, get with me afterwards and I'll put you in touch with our team who actually works on these case sets. It's not an individual thing. I have IO scientists looking at it. We have industry partners looking at it because we have to match those. Um, but if it's not li lining up, I, that's, I need that feedback so right. we can make that change. So, so I have been working with our cybersecurity team our J1 team trying to fix that because I'm the very first one that got affected and my cert coming due. So I have a good interest in that. Okay. So the question for you, James, yes, is sir. that I just got a note from CompTIA okay. that they have another curriculum program. However, they do not take bulk um, um, payment, meaning you're not going to take Navy coup, uh, uh token or, or anything to that effect for us to continue for education. So how does that work now? We can do that. Uh, we can, uh, as far as the automated bullet payment, we would do that. But uh, there's a gentleman who is just chuckling uh, somewhat behind you. I'd like you to turn around. He's got his hand waving there in the Hawaiian shirt. Mr. Munjin, come on up here just real quick, if you don't mind very quickly, because we have other questions here. But John, uh, what, uh, just to give a quick answer, John, I think, can take care of your issue. And uh, there you go. John, are yeah. you live? You yes. Uh, thanks, James. You bet. Uh, for anybody that carries any of the CompTIA certifications, if you need continuing ed tokens to renew it or continuing ed products in bulk, uh, we can help you with that. Okay. So there you go. Now, let me ask you this in terms of uh, certification providers, the changes that Mark is talking about. When I say certification providers, John at ISACA, Jim with Fitzy. Brian with uh, Sans GX. These changes from 8570 to 8140, what are your observations? How has that impacted what uh, the things that you provide uh, and certifications that you provide? What are some of the observations that you have? Uh, John. So let's talk with challenges, right? Okay. Is one of the things is I heard Mark here talking about, if, if the DOD is going to be that responsive and continue to adapt, which it, it needs to, if it doesn't converge with what's happening in the in the commercial sector, we're going to have a problem with alignment, yep. and which has been a long-standing issue, right? So, um, what I would argue is that cyber is not just a DO thing, DoD thing. It's not just a civilian market thing. It, it is truly a joint thing. All myself and my colleagues here, as well as James, anybody who develops certification programs, those are globally represented volunteers that are driving that based on some job role. 
just because you're in the DOD doesn't mean that you shouldn't be involved in, in actually participating in some of that too. So that, that would be my, it, it's, it's an observation. There's not enough government and mm. DOD specific people, I would say, that are actually getting involved outside of their uniform time. That's a part of it you can give back to help shape that. Because the reality is a lot of you that are doing cyber, and I was one of them as a 20 year Navy guy, yeah. we are on the cutting edge. You are. That's why you're in high demand outside of the government. But that's you can't help the rest of the globe if you keep all that stuff internal to you. Thank you very much. In terms of challenges, Brian or Jim, uh, additional uh, uh, observations. So I think that uh, one of the uh, challenges is going to be going from the 8570 framework, which was a bit more cookie cutter approach, to mm -hmm. a more uh, all-encompassing uh, fluid yeah all -encompassing? yeah I mean now you've got over 50 work roles mm -hmm. I think that's actually going to be an advantage in a lot of ways for I the agree. workforce because we ultimately have a lot more options available so you, you hear a lot of people criticize for example hey my specific 8570 cert didn't really correlate to my job mm -hmm. whereas now with having a, a deeper depth if you will in terms of the case ads that Mark was talking about I think you're gonna find that there's gonna actually be better alignment in a lot of cases. It's not gonna be perfect because there are aspects of it that still need to be, continue to be worked on relative to depth and proficiency levels. But I think we're gonna see uh, a better workforce that's gonna to continue to mature and continue to improve. Uh, things such as uh, software development, for example, additional work roles that Mark was alluding to. Now you have a question, make sure uh, you have a hot daggers in the back of your mind because I'm gonna let Brian say something here. But then uh, he's next, so. <laughs> So all, right, all right, Brian, this one was for oh, Mark. No, no, okay, oh, okay, no, no, that's okay. Okay, okay, all right, go for it. You want me to go? You go. Bruce Gordon from uh, Third Network Battalion, Marine Corps. Thanks, Bruce. Um, from the 8140 uh, transition from 8570, uh, over the course of however many years we've had 8570, we've seen some hesitancy from some human resource uh, offices mm. to actually hold people accountable for the requirement of having a certification. Interesting. So, which, so you're saying basically because of that transition, there are some folks who are just like, well, maybe we can't enforce what so, we were enforcing. Am yeah, I saying really, that right? The enforcement is the question. Does 8140 give us any teeth to move from uh, allowing people yeah, to test indefinitely like to actually <laughs> removing people uh, okay. or at least finding a way to get them what I they have need. a feeling that's a Mark so, Gorak question. Thank you. <laughs> right. But I think Brian can answer it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, go for it, Mark. I can, but... <laughs> okay, so I, I think the end goal is the same. We want a trained and ready workforce. The, the issue or the challenge you're describing is if I have individuals, specific on the civilian side, I'm assuming, who are not trained and ready, what are our options? Yes. So my, my future solution to this, if you've read our strategy and our implementation plan, is what I fundamentally believe is skills-based assessments. So it's not a foreign concept, by the way. We have it in the medical profession. You had to maintain certification to maintain your license. Similar to that, but not exactly the same, I think cyber should adopt a similar strategy. What that empowers us to do for our civilian workforce is it requires, right now, 80, 80, 8740, 8140 requires 20 continual education credits but we don't dictate what those are. So almost anything counts, supervisor determines. I get that question a lot, but okay, well that doesn't mean you're proficient. So I'd like to throw you in a cyber range if you're a network analyst and see if you're actually proficient and at what level. And the power that I have is I can't fire you per se, but I can incentivize to go from basic to intermediate to advanced. And I'm making up numbers here, but I'll say we have to incentivize whatever that incentive is. It could be financial, it could be others. But if I incentivized our advanced level at 20K a year, uh, that would be something that people would strive to do. Mm. And if you don't maintain that, because it's not an ABC test, it's in a cyber range doing your actual KSATs, and I measure level of proficiency, and if you're not proficient, zero. If you are proficient, some level. If you're intermediate, some level. If you're advanced, the highest level. Whatever those levels are. Uh, so that's my idea to get after that specific challenge. 
but I want to caution, and these guys hate this when I say this, but certifications may not be the answer. So 8140 specifically allows for experience, education, certifications, um, as well as experience, which is the huge big change. What experience do you have? How do you gain that experience? If you're a programmer and you're doing apps for Apple or somebody else, that's experience, that's programming. It's not a certification, it's not, but you're at a sub-level. Throw you into a cyber range and see what your actual level of proficiency is and measure that and then incentivize. Does that get after your uh, question? Yeah, it does, thanks. It's exciting, I'm looking forward to that $20,000 check. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was gonna say that problem doesn't just exist in DOD. That problem exists in a corporate marketplace. That's a corporate thing. That problem exists everywhere, so. As far as, uh, uh, okay, the next question. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so. Uh, uh, give us your name. I'm Captain Luke Strain with Thanks, First Kevin. Army. Great. And I'm going to go ahead and apologize because I'm talking to Mark again because my boss told me to never let a senior leader who wants feedback leave without giving them my feedback. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, there's two big pieces of feedback. As somebody who has, I've never, I'm a signal officer in the Army. I have never worked in a network command. I've always been with basically ground pounders, right? Yes, right. The... So first, what you're talking about, cyber training, as, and again, this is an Army problem, not a, DO, not a DOD. This is Army specific is, if that is exactly how the Army treats, ev treats its training, but they apply it to signal very poorly. And that's, a, like, we have a system for that, like with METS in training. And for me, as no one cares about the signal training, that's how, that's how it feels sometimes. They just care about works or not works, whereas I think, we have systems for that, and we need to get signal training there. But so when you're talking with Army people about it, that that's what Captain Strain thinks, and maybe that can inform some of your discussions with them about how they could get it there. But the real reason I want to come up is to feedback about the new regulations and the cyber workforce roles. Okay. Because you know, like, so the questions you were asking the the, the other soldier, who, the guy who came up, I learned those about two months ago through entirely self-discovery just because I was on FMS web, which is how the Army does manning, and saw cyber workforce, which was new. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of looking around, and, I, and then, oh, oh, look, I have cyber workforce roles. This is great. Oh, this is how I can get more certification, because I want to increase my certification, but I've never known how to prove I needed it. I know that I did. So as far as someone who's been my entire Army career managing soldiers who work on networks, we don't know how to prove that we need the things that we need. Everyone says we need it, and we, but we don't know how to prove it. Interesting. And so the cyber workforce roles is it. And the, so my, our problem is education, because everything that I, the only reason I can answer those questions you were asking before is because I did self-discovery on, 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 on like an army portal. And maybe that's, what, maybe that's what we expect, but that's the problem is education. So if there was some program that says, if you're a 25 Bravo in the Army assigned in this role, mm -hmm. this is how you see your cyber workforce roles. You can, go to this web, you can go to this website or this regulation, see these roles. These are the things you would probably be entitled to, technical one, and after this much experience, you're probably technical two. And you can't do that for every job in the Army, but you could do it for a few so that people can look and then be able to get those things. So that, that's my feedback to you. So hopefully you can, that can inform discussions and decision makings as you're talking to the Army decision makers about it. it again, I like recognize what, that's not DOD. So what you're saying is, Army. is there a need for kind of a pathway, a defined pathway, or a way for you to evaluate yourself against that pathway? Is that what you're saying? Yes. There's a, there's a need for like, there's a need for the soldiers who are in cyber workforce roles to be able to know how to figure out their cyber workforce roles because that education is not there. They just know they're in it. Like, it's, <laughs> I know I need Security Plus. I don't know why. I don't know what I don't know what it means, but I know that I need it. So that way, I can get my admin card and do my job. You know, right, but right. they don't know how to prove it. What the context is, exactly. right? There's the what, and then there's the so right. what, right? Answers to that, folks. Yeah, so uh, again, we put it out to all the components. The strategy is out, the invitation plan is out. DODEmergingTech.com will give you your case sets for whatever yeah. world you have. By the way, you can have up to three right now. We have in the personnel systems, we have up to three roles that you can be designated as. Each one of those have different case sets by definition, right? Each work role is distinguished between each uh, by less than 25% overlap. So if you have more than 25% overlap, you're automatically pinched in this work role. 
Uh, and then that'll give you your case sets. Your case sets then are the requirements for what training, certifications, education you need. And the mill side, we actually are doing better, but of all the components, the Army, um, I'm working with now the new CIO, Leo Garcia, specifically to help enforce this. Part of the Army's challenge is because the cyber workforce is mills, civ, and contractors, no one entity in a component owns all three of those. So when I work with the Army, they go like this. It's CIO, no, it's the one, no, it's you know the three, no, it's... Mm. I'm so not surprised. I am trying to get them to commit, and I did get this, uh, the new CIO to commit that he owns this. Now, he's been on board less than two months. Give him a shot I'm good. I'm to good. get it out to the force. Well, Mark's a data guy, but let me ask, uh, give you uh, something good. of an answer. I think Brian can speak to this more articulately, uh, because each of these, uh, Jim, uh, John, ISC2, have all contributed to this. We created a mapping between these job roles right, that you we're discussing, and certification. We kind of see ourselves putting the teeth into the education there. That's available off the C3 website. But I think you need more data, is why I brought up that Mark's a data guy. And I think that's what you need. And I think, Brian, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so currently we're all mapping, all the certification bodies are mapping right now to the different work roles. So give you an idea, we're up to like number 20-ish right now mm -hmm. in the system. So what's going through is, now they're signing off, they're reviewing those and things along those lines. I know all of the bodies, we're all doing, we're that. All doing that right now. Um, so Mark, hopefully I'm not going to put you, is December, I believe, when they were talking about making that live or do we know? Yeah, that's, that's our goal, but December is a month away. So within the DOD Emerging Tech, there's a link there that will give you what the plan is, is we have an AI-based developed work, you know, using natural language programming that ties your specific work role, and then it'll tie to the training that you can go to from all the vendors, from military training, component training, it's all in there, how much it costs, what work role it satisfies. So mm -hmm. if you attend this certification over this number of time, yeah. you'll be qualified in this work role. So we're hoping to have about 10,000 vendors in there we're hoping to have a feedback loop in there. So if you go to a training that Brian's organization puts on and it was great, you can say this was great training, well worth the money. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. And vice versa, right? So kind of a feedback in there. Um, but that's the, the link that we're going to provide because we have to certify all of their programs that it does meet yeah. the case stats for this training. Uh, so that's, that's our responsibility. That is 10,000 vendors. No human can manage all of that. Right. I only have a shop of six people. So this is just one thing we do. So we've enticed AI. They provide their offerings. We then search through all the mappings and say, yes, it qualifies, no, it doesn't. And then we rely on feedback from the community on whether I trained me. Now, the question that you should be asking me is great. Um, who's going to pay for it? That's, what I, that's, that's definitely what I was wondering. Right? Uh, now, from a mill side, your mill training is covered. You just have to put it into your you know, military training right. request with the justification of the case ads to go to it. On the civilian side, you got to come up with the money, right? So now what's free is your mill side training. Why don't the civilians go to the NSA training or your component training? They can. So you just have to enable the seats to allow that training to happen. So again, this feeds on itself. I give you the requirements. Mm -hmm. Now you have to fight for resources based on those requirements to satisfy the educational requirements so we have a trained and ready workforce. Absolutely. I, I'm excited about, I'm very excited about that AI thing. That sounds great. It sounds going to be very helpful. So my well, team yeah. will be good now. So I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Too. Thank you very December much. December is what we put out. I'm hoping that happens. Yeah, Did I will give, you, give you an idea. So we have like an incident handling certification. The case sets of that one alone were 587. But like our foundational one, I think hit upwards of like 800 and plus case sets that somebody's standing there going map, 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 map across the board. We're doing the same thing. With, uh, I saw is doing the same thing. CompTIA. Uh, yeah, we're the all, same doing right thing. all doing that. Uh, additional questions or we have someone right okay. behind you. Thank we'll you. just go right to that question. Hi, what's your name? Hi, sorry. I'm short. Uh, I'm Carrie. I'm Hi, Carrie. Floral site. Um, so you had mentioned that these skill assessments were something that were like really important to do. Is that something that you would put on your website or on, you know, where people are going to your framework to say that we really 
closer. Okay. Um, that is really recommended for people to be able to do because I think those skill assessments are super important for them to know exactly what skill gaps they have. And I think people yep. aren't aware of what those skill assessments are capable of doing for them. So a difficult question to answer. Uh, so two parts to skills assessment. The first part that I'd like to implement is skills-based hiring. And I have OPM, o OMB, uh, all the components are for this. The difficulty is getting agreement among the components that they will accept this skill-based. So when you go into a cyber range and you come out at a certain level of proficiency, I want to mandate that that person then is qualified for that position, mm -hmm. which means a hiring manager under cyber accepted service on the civilian side could immediately hire them. Right. Okay, gain approval for that assessment tool, right, and the level of proficiency from all the services and components is not a trivial task, and I have yet to make that happen. So the Air Force Research Lab, the Army Research Lab have assessments capabilities. Industry will come to me every day and tell me, oh, we already have this. We have a cyber range and you can come in and we'll tell you your level of proficiency. <laughs> Great, under what standards and who approves it? And how do I make that up, you know, the scalable the and updatable? Yeah. Right? It's not a trivial thing to make happen. And I had to fight with HR to say that that then is qualification. Right? That's another non-trivial event. So have you tested certain companies' skill assessments and how they go about that? Because like, I know we do skill assessments for that. Like We have 33 of some 50 role IQs already built out for it with the skill assessments. So I'd just be curious what, what like passes as what you guys would want on to how so companies no, have. No decisions. We're still in the implementation phase of making that happen. Got it. Okay. I mean, so that's, that's let me another... st stop right there. What assessments do you use? What do you use? Well, our company has AI generated skill assessments for, okay. we have over 300 different skill assessments okay. that we do. Um, but they are, they are pertain to roles. So there's certain ones like we do training for the security plus. And so we've taken that whole framework and done role IQs for 33 of the different roles. And so we have the different skill assessments that go along with those roles as well. Thank you. So and again, I don't know what company you're from, but in a company setting, well, site. you have full control over that. For DOD, I have 225,000 people in my workforce, right. and I have many different components to have to get approval for. Got it. So it takes a long time to make this happen. But I, that's one of the feedbacks I need from industry, is what's out there, what's working right now, and then start assessing these. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Thanks. appreciate it. Additional question here, sir, what's your name and what's your question? Oh, sorry, uh, John, I was... So I just wanted to piggyback on a couple of things Mark just mentioned here. We are talking about, yeah, obviously, this this idea of driving to skills-based hiring and, and mm -hmm. skills-based assessment it makes a lot of sense. I, from an industry perspective, I could tell you I had built a program five years ago. The, work, the market does not want it, right? And it's one of the things that we fundamentally have to shift hmm. the mindset because everybody wants an easy button. And that's a societal problem right now. Um, it, it, the other thing when you're looking at these skills-based programs right now, there's inherent bias built into everything. And I think the thing that we need to be very cognizant of is the role that technology and, and vendor tools play in this whole thing. Because myself and my colleagues up here, we represent, we're vendor neutral, right? And, and, we, and that's done purposefully, right? Because the goal is if you're competent in a particular area, you should be able to take those skills and apply them in dissimilar environments. Different areas. The problem is that we are not good at that at all. And, and I would argue that this is largely... A, a, a very huge academic issue. And it's, it's one that we talk about this all the time. There's a reason why soft skills trumps all of the technical stuff that's out there today. If you look at what the primary gap is, quote unquote gap, it's in that area. People repeatedly said we can teach people to do technical tasks all day long, but this isn't limited to just tech fields. Every occupation that I've talked to the, the folks that are working in every kind of industry that's out there, we're all facing that. And I think the, the, there's a lot of external constraints influencing a lot of this stuff. Thanks, John. Addition, additions to that from, uh, from anybody, from Mark, uh, Jim, uh, Brian? I mean, I agree with John. I mean, it's interesting because 
in this industry, like for example, we do actually in our certification have lab-based testing. To get there, that was a very complicated process. <laughs> yeah. And as strange as it sounds that I believe all of us ran into problems because we're all accredited, that actually went against what consider accreditation is for not cybersecurity, but for certification. So we all had a little bit of, I think, if John, if that's fair to say, an uphill battle. Um, well, we, we worked with them. We, yeah. we worked with them, just kind of, you know. Well, just and it also issues. speaks to where where I told you about where a, a full blown skills bake a, a certification program it, it fell on its face. To be honest with you, the, the market didn't want it, and you're also limited in what how much you can assess in a fixed amount of time. Right. So what I hear Mark, you know, talking about, and going back to my active duty days, we had your individual training time, then you had the team trainer stuff as well. And I think that's really where the mix is as a whole workforce, is getting to that point, both public and private sector. You know, right now things are more trending towards hybrid assessments because yeah. you. The reality is, is in order to adequately cover what it is, these case sets that are out there, you can't do it in just a skills based thing at one sitting. You could do it in aggregate, but then the the question becomes is. I can only imagine the challenge that the DOD at the policy level is trying to have right now is every service is doing something different. I was right. a Navy guy. You look at the syscom and all the systems they're bringing on and what tools you're using at any given time. And, you know, in my, you know, for, you use a ship for an example. No ship within their, within a fixed period of time was there a lot of commonality. Hmm. Right, because you're on different upgrade schedules and stuff. So there are really some unique challenges, and but they're not so unique because there's parallels on what's happening in the commercial market too. Because just every, you know, you look at out in the vendor space, there's so many vendors offering something. But you need to tie back to the requirements, and I think if there's no other tie tie back, is Mark in the 8140 program office has actually at least set forth a roadmap. There's a lot of challenges out there, and from an HR perspective, holy cow! Like to get to that point where you can enforce it and not to kick the can. I'm sitting there with popcorn myself to wait and to see how <laughs> it's going to all play out. Okay, this next question can't be for me, Paul. Yeah, go ahead. So my name is Paul. Um, <laughs> I've got, I think, two questions. Uh, but first, I just want to say thank you for being up here. Thank you for being invested in this. Thank you for trying to get this right. This is a difficult challenge. Um, so I, I ask these questions with love. Uh, personal experience, uh, it was very cl clear in the actual operational command that there is a um, misunderstanding of the necessity for these skill sets to be part of the actual operational force. Oftentimes, cyber skill sets are seen as some enterprise resource, enterprise capability. Go do the cyber tech thing, that's great. But when it comes to actually like, go fight a war, we need people on the ground with cyber skill sets. <laughs> there is a quote by a very senior person in a military service that says, there is no requirement or demand for these skill sets in the operational force. How do you intend to change the cultural understanding of the necessity of this skill set across everything that we do in the DoD is question one. I always say the most difficult part of our jobs is changing culture. But you did hear the Admiral speak this morning at the keynote. And what did he say are fu some of the fundamental challenges? Decision advantage and how do we get there? Through data, right? Through technologies. So I think it's an educational process, I think, starting with the senior leaders, so they change the mindset that this is important. I think the upcoming, the new hires, the new people we're bringing in already have this mindset because they were born with technology in their hands. So it's a matter of the middle layer and getting to them and having them understand. You know, I, I fought this battle here with COCOMs specifically on, you know, when they make an order, how do I incorporate cyber in that? Because the kinetic effect, I already know my you know, kill ratios, and I know exactly how many bombs I have to drop to get a certain effect. What effects do I get with cyber and prove it to me that this will happen? Very difficult to do, right? So it's a mindset and a cultural shift. I think it's going to happen whether we like it or not. 
It's just a matter of how fast we can make happen. And you of all people know the frustrations of trying to make this um, at the senior levels of the military uh, incorporated in their thinking. You know, now, I'm curious, from your perspective, what would you say are some of the changes that you see that are necessary? Or you're just, you, know, you want to hear it from us? Sure. Uh, uh, I do want to hear it from you. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps I'm heavy handed, but make actual skill identifiers of cyber software data as a requirement in order to actually get promoted as a requirement in order to actually get, uh, quite frankly, anywhere in the service. Uh, make it as desirable in the Army as a Ranger tab is. Right, uh, that that would that would, and there are there are certain ways that you could impose on the middle layer of for them to hit. You know, it's going to be wrong, sure, but it'll start to force the hand of people to understand there are certain skill sets that are needed in order to fight a war, and understanding technology is one of them. And I don't think that this is even. I'll use the army as an example. It's not like a branch discussion of like you had a signal officer talk. Cool, it would make sense for signaler to go cyber, right? But like, where are your armor people? Like, where are your actual like? Infantry people, like where are the people, the under, understanding that technology is an imperative, they do have it, Mark, coming out of school. They're growing up within their hands. Problem is they're not in a leadership position to impose it on the Army as a necessity as part of the operational force. I know you don't disagree. Well, background here, Paul and I fought this battle three or four <laughs> years ago trying to change this whole thing with the digital, what I'll label the digital workforce, which we never defined, but is it everyone? Are we all part of the digital workforce? At some level, and that's what Paul is getting at here, I, I think yes, we all have to have some understanding. Even to the effect of if you look at an XY graph to be able to determine what that data actually means. right? Something as simple as that, which we were saying all people need to understand. Some level of data science, some level of data interpretation. Uh, understanding of how data can be manipulated and even in the AI realm, tagging um, and, and knowing what data is good and what data is not. Um, so at some fundamental level, I 100% agree. Don't know how we're going to get there. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll have to. It's a matter of how to make that happen. And I will say this, Congress just hit me up. There is now a specific cyber award. So, and I, when I inquired to the Hill about why we were making us do this, they said, well, how many awards does infantry have? How many awards does armor have? And how many awards does cyber have? Zero. So they said, you're going to make one. So I'm in the process of making that happen. And by the way, for the military out there, it's a military award, and it's tied to money. Uh, so you can get money if you have a cyber uh, innovative idea, and it's actually implemented you can be submitted for this award and get up to $2,500. And a coin? And a coin. No, I don't know about coin. <laughs> so, I was Jim, just, I was just going to piggyback off that because, like, you know, um, there are agencies today that actually do have programs like that. Homeland Security has one. They have a cyber skills incentive program. Uh, State Department does. And so they actually award, kind of, I think, in your kind of idea of a 20 or 25% bump in salary as a way to kind of get people motivated to go and pursue a certification or pursue a training program. I don't know if that's kind of what you're thinking, but I wanted just to kind of throw that out there as a, a way to kind of influence culture, because I've seen that pretty effectively done at those agencies. Yeah, I, I appreciate that as well, but I, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not just the supply of skill sets and incentivizing people to go and get those skill sets, it's the demand of those skill sets in certain places. The demand is clear in cyberspace is great, but our ability to understand data, use data effectively in a cyber contested world is a necessity, I would argue, everywhere because technology is everywhere in its use. Second question is, I uh, saw part of the intention for the implementation plan uh, when it comes to recruiting talent and the actual time it takes to onboard means something about like 60 days or something like that, right? Well, I, saw, I saw 60, my friend. Um, that's the goal. I got you. It's all good. Uh, something we have in private industry is how we incentivize our recruiting teams to actually bring in exceptional talent. I have never seen that demonstrated in any effective way in the Department of Defense. I have seen it in the IC personally over at National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. What I do see is incentivizing people to try and not get you know, sued or fired or something along those lines. How do you change the actual mindset of the recruiters within the DOD that it is their job to bring in the best talent as quickly and effectively as possible. Okay, I'm glad you asked this question. So um, <clears throat> here's IRD, 
our idea, and we're actually putting it into practice with a pilot. Again, I start small and then with the whole mindset of scale. So I, I basically want to do away with our current hiring processes. What I want to do is I want to flip it around. So we're going to conduct a pilot in first quarter of, uh, second quarter of 24. Cyber accepted service hiring pilot where <clears throat> the applicant is the focus. The individual who you're, the candidate is the focus. Mm -hmm. That's the main focus of the whole hiring pilot. And the way we get these candidates is through third party, uh, I'll call them partners, that could be vendors, but there's a bunch of nonprofits out there that will specialize in a certain field. Mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. of the fields I feel passionate about is the neurodivergent field. So I have a vendor out there that specializes in neurodivergent. They take those, that population and they tie them to our case ads. And they say, that, and if they don't have the right training and skills to meet a certain work role, they will train them for free. I don't even have to pay for it. At the output of that, they will tell me these people are qualified, qualified for this certain work role. That's great. They'll never get a job in DOD in our normal hiring process. So instead, I want to put them through a skills assessment hiring process, which is our pilot, and say if you pass this exam in range, cyber range, if you guys want to see one, go to the cyber challenge. It's happening right now here. To me, if you pass that and you're the winning team, you're qualified. I don't know why you wouldn't be. Okay? How do you know how to metricize that? What, me what metrics have you seen come out of cyber ranges? Because we do the same thing and we have Well, that's the, that's the hard part, right? And, but there I are, think there what are we need to talk metrics. about here, folks, is indicators of achievement. You guys heard of the concept of the indicator of compromise or indicator of attack? You guys know what I'm talking about? I think the main thing culturally, starting from the top down, is agreeing on what indicators of achievement are and that they're truly metrics that have been validated psychometrically according to a job role. I think that's the critical thing. The devil is in the details. So when it comes to indicators of achievement, Mark, John, Jim, Brian, what kind of indicators of achievement do you tend to look for when it comes to an, uh, an assessment? Critical. How do, you, how do you go about doing that? I would say some of those soft skills that John was talking about are important. Critical thinking, mm -hmm. um, creativity, um, uh, I, dare I say intuition? I don't know. You know, things that are more subjective, mm. maybe not quite so objective. But I think John hit it on the, on the head. We can, we can train people how to, you know, pull a lever or configure something, but getting them to think about it, especially with what Mark was saying relative to how it's changing every 12 months, we need a, we need a workforce that's capable of adapting and being able mm. to deal with the current state today as it continues to evolve. So I think, I think those soft skills are really powerful. But how many of your recruiters actually understand the skill sets needed in the applied space of the mission? See, that's, I think it's an excellent question. Yeah, it, it has to come from the top. We did a survey at CompTIA, we all do surveys. Mark does, uh, uh, I, Isaka does, IC, IC2, Zanzgiak, Fitzy. We, and one of the surveys we did, we asked 500 CIOs, CISOs, what their main concerns were. And they're basically came down to lack of process maturity. And they basically said the main thing that we are running into is that business pressures, business pressures, and this is government or whatever, is causing problematic practices to be put in place. You can have the most talented technician, you can have the most talented, uh, you have the best tech out there, but if you have a condition driven by what I call cowboy IT, lack of process maturity. You can put the best teams in there and they're never going to succeed. Is that kind of where you're going or are you going somewhere else with that? I think I'm going in a bit of a different space and I'll give you a oh, few okay. examples. Right. You have a uh, passion about uh, driving after neurodivergent hires, right? Neurodivergent hires, your ability to give them highly transactional work where they're able to do highly focused work for eight hours a ah, day and just mm -hmm. crank. You're not necessarily looking for emotional quotient, you're looking for a kind of a certain kind of applied that, skill set. Your recruiter needs to understand the constraints and the opportunity of those roles aligned to the mission in order to then source the right talent and be pointed about how quickly you're gonna bring in that talent. What I've seen demonstrated is your recruiting is separated from the applied mission space. Uh, they're aligned to an organization, but they're not incentivized on the outcomes derived by that organization and the skill sets needed to get there. 
And so therefore, you see growth of recruiters in HR practices that is about keeping the books clean, that it is about driving the best talent. To me, there is carrots and sticks hmm. that you can use in that space in order to force a change of behavior. Otherwise, you're not going to hit the metrics as part of your implementation plan. I will right. bow off the <laughs> soapbox, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah, so just, Paul, to, to finish that question, though, is I kind of want to hire the recruiters to build the supply side and have them ready and available and qualified for every case that I have, for every work role I have. Then from the hiring manager standpoint, under cyber accepted service, I can do direct hiring based on qualification and don't have to go through all that HR in the middle. Of course, the number one problem in the DOD is most of our cyber positions require a clearance. If you're new to the government, getting that clearance is a time consuming process. What, we're, what I'm pushing for and I need, this is another hard uh, thing to push for is higher conditional based on clearance acceptance. The IC community will not give me the numbers, I've asked several times, but how many clearances that are submitted are denied? My hypothesis is it's less than 2%. So from a risk standpoint, from a senior level, am I willing to take a 2% risk of hiring a candidate on an uh, exception pending security clearance validation, but bring them in because they're fully qualified for the position, and if they do not get their clearance, then they are separated. But 98% of the time they will, and now I have the candidate on board immediately, rather than waiting up to six months for them to get that clearance. Another policy thing which is very difficult to implement at scale. So, so uh, I'd recommend you reach out to NGA, and I'll only give this as an example because I happen to work there. I work in the software space, and we all talk about dev low, deploy high. Part of the main push for dev low, deploy high was to be able to source uncleared personnel to do the actual development work. Right. And we actually changed all security and personnel policy around clearance requirement for actually getting hired, created tools and processes and environments for uncleared people to still contribute huh. and do work. And that was part of the data core and the dev core initiative over at NGA. I can give you the POCs if you'd like, but I think it's a great model that actually has shown great benefit to the mission as well. Additional questions, folks, feel free to stand up and ask them. I don't see anybody standing up yet here, so I'll go to our questions here. Okay. Sounds like Oh, yes. Oh, we do have a question. We Thank you. Five minutes. We had seven Thanks, minutes. John. And we're about seven minutes before we end, so yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, I just had a question about the advanced area, uh, specifically the 500 series, 600 series cyber under 8140. How did you go about choosing the, the JIAC SAN certification? How did you make those choices? And were the financial ramifications considered uh, against both the taxpayer, the government agencies, and small businesses that need to now qualify for these positions? Not $9,000 yeah, for a certification is, is absurd. Then you've got to travel to the location for five to seven days. Uh, and pay for a per diem, room costs, et cetera. It's fourteen to fifteen thousand dollars just for a single certification. So we do offer various programs where that cost does go down, and we do offer special programs for DoD. We also have programs for the intelligence community. So, for example, we're part of NSA's uh, Cryptologic School. Uh, we're also part of the Army and the Air Force School. So there is options that are out there. We are also an accredited school, so we do offer GI Bill benefits. Uh, we also have a work study program. We also have like a military transition program where actually our certifications are free and it does include the training with it. Um, there is options available. Like I would say since COVID, more than half the folks actually take our courses and our certifications virtually. I will admit ours are sometimes a little bit more than the other ones out there in the marketplace. Part of the reason behind that is, um, for give you an example, we offer about 50 certifications. They're built specific for work roles. They're a little bit more intermediate to an advance. They're built from the top practitioners that are actually out there in the marketplace. So when it becomes like an ICS, we'll hire those people that do that or a mobile forensics. So that's why you see sometimes those different costs when it comes to our certifications. Uh, same with our training and things like that. But we do try to offer a whole bunch of different avenues. And there is a lot of stuff that we do with DOD specifically 
where those costs don't, like for example, we're under Navy Cool. God, the list goes on and on and on. But the big things are we are in with a whole bunch of the different schools where we do offer that. Um, if you are looking at a military transition now into the corporate marketplace, we do offer that. Um, we give about, I think it's like about 200 just alone in the military. We also have programs for women. Uh, we also have diversity programs. And we even have a couple state programs on that one. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah, but what about those folks who are not military and they're trying to enter the cyber field? I mean, that's where you're going to get fresh talent from, right? So yes. that's, it's a barrier to entry to, to have to pay that kind of money to get certified to be considered advanced. Yeah, well, there so, are multiple um, options. Go well, first ahead, of all, we're, we're anticipating advanced level is uh, like 5 to 10% of the total population. Yeah. So the tip of the spear, if you will, uh, in advanced level. But that's where, where our um, training platform I told you before about 10,000 vendors, so it'll provide more choice. So we will, that's growing, you know, we're hoping to have it out by December. So you'll get in there, if you have a certain work role that you're trying to go after, it'll provide you a list of potential vendors. One of them is theirs, but we're gonna have choice. There so is no choice, it's prescribed. It's only the SANS DRIAC certifications, GCS, GCFA specifically. Yeah, uh, that's today. I'm trying to open that up okay, so okay. you have more choice. That's and if it helps, fantastic. if it helps, a lot of times when people have GX certifications, they have started off with one of these other providers. If you look, you would see that about 90% of the folks yeah. have a Security Plus, they'll have a CISA, SISM. So it's very common that people have come in with other certifications and then they move up to the GIAC as they become more specialized. So when you're talking about the GCFA, which is our forensic certification, that's an example. We have a whole series of curriculum just on forensics. So to give you an idea, we offer like 15, anything from mobile to um, ransomware to threat intelligence, the list goes on from there. But they're very specific, if that makes sense, on a particular work role. I'm just gonna add, you know, I'm. I take a little bit different perspective, only because you know my role at ISOC is a, is a lot broader than just certs. And certs are important, and it's not to diminish them because truly they are the they are the most prominent way of of assessing individuals today across most in uh, most occupations if built correctly. Um, I'm a huge fan of increasing the market. But the requirements that are out there too, and, and this is one we, we just need to keep in mind, is the programs need to be built correctly. And, and whether you're a training provider or a cert body, there's been certain requirements that have been delineated. And, and I think over time, those are the, gonna be the things that we're, we continue to contend with. Uh, they are external constraints right now uh, of sorts, uh, but they're all with the, um, they're all laser focused on fair, fairness and reliability. And I think we, we cannot lose sight of that at the end of the day. Um, there's a lot of good programs that are out there today. Whether or not they're scalable or not is yet to be seen. Um, <laughs> culture is so important to all of this right now. There, there's people that are out there that will claim um, that there's four million open cyber jobs across the globe. And that's not inclusive of you all. All right. I'm going to tell you right now, if from my perspective, and I'm really angry as a as a for, as a practitioner, right, as a practitioner advocate at a cert body, that there's a ton of folks that have spent a lot of hard-earned time, money, and energy to go get trained, and you know what? They can't get jobs. Yeah. And we all collectively should be ashamed of that. There's so many there's, barriers to entry, right? There, I mean, there is ga problem. gatekeeping mm -hmm. is real. Let, let's talk yeah. about that. Gatekeeping within the DOD is real. Mark talked about a big prominent piece of that with clearance. Clearance is a huge thing, right? As a former guy who would love to go back and work on mission, nobody wants to touch you to, to, to invest in you to pay for a clearance, right? So when we're talking about supply, where do you have to start? You need to start at the entry level. And guess what we do not have enough of? Entry level positions. So that's both public and private sector. So right now we're all <laughs> stealing from one another. Or there are a lot of entry level positions, but they're written as advanced positions. Yep. I would argue that, but, but, they're, but they're not entry level in that regard. That's they're entry require. level because they don't want to pay you the money. That's that, right. That's really what it that's boils really what down to. Saying. 
or they'll have five years. Except the DOD has the largest entry level positions. It's called our military. Yeah. So we take you out of high school and we <laughs> send you to training for a year and then give you three to four years of experience. And now my issue is how do I keep you? So the military side is one way to alleviate this problem. And we service all of you with our graduates and our experience. So from the military side, we have the most entry level positions of any other organization. And it's Mark's job to make sure that people are able to upskill and they provide evidence of that along the way. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark, John, Jim, Brian. Thank you very much for your time. Folks, we're at the end of the time. We have all sorts of time. Uh, we can answer your questions and we'll go from there. Thank you again, everybody. We'll talk later. <laughs>